Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Mission Impossible Real World Cycling. My name is Shelly Parker, Sustainable Travel Services Program Manager, and I coordinate with the Sustainable Commute Partners at our, munici my, our municipalities and universities across the region, and I will be your host today. Thank you to everyone who's joined us with a special thank you to our regional chambers of commerce, business membership organizations, employers, and our bike groups around the triangle who help spread the word about this webinar. Your assistance has helped to make this group remarkably diverse and a true representation of our triangle community. We are especially grateful to Bike Durham who provided staff, board members, and volunteers to partner, to partner in the development of this webinar and in a new video that will premiere in today's webinar. We've got some housekeeping and uh, Zoom controls review. So I hope you will please take a moment to familiarize yourself with the chat and the Q&A boxes at the bottom of the page. They are two separate boxes. Feel free to add your name and organization in the chat so we get to know each other if you haven't already. Today's session is being recorded and we'll share the recording usually within about 24 to 48 hours after the event. And all attendees will be muted during the session. Throughout the session, you are encouraged to ask questions during the webinar using the Q&A button located in the Zoom bar. When we transition to the Q&A portion of the webinar, attendees are welcome to ask their questions live with their cameras on. So if you would like to ask your question in person, please indicate so by raising your hand in the chat. We have enabled live transcription service as well, and subtitles can be shown by accessing the live transcript option in your Zoom toolbar. And now we have a word from our legal department. So you can reference it on the screen. I will read it aloud. Go Triangle is the host of this session in partnership with Bike Durham. Justin Laidlaw, Bike Durham Board of Directors and League of American Bicyclists League Cycling Instructor. This session is meant to be an overview of bicycle safety best practices for riding in mixed traffic. The webinar is not all-inclusive of North Carolina bike and pedestrian laws, nor does it serve as a directive of planning for individual cyclists or organizations. Advice, graphics, images, and information contained in this webinar are presented for general education and informational purposes and to increase overall safety awareness. It is not intended to be legal, medical, or other expert advice or services and should not be used in place of consultation with appropriate professionals. Neither the host nor partners shall be held liable for any improper or incorrect use of the information described and or contained herein and assumes no responsibility for anyone's use of the information. In no event shall the host or partner be liable for any direct, indirect, incidental, or any type of damages whatsoever caused by any safety measures discussed herein. No warranty, expressed or implied, is made regarding accuracy, completeness, reliability, or usefulness of any information contained herein. And with that said, I would like to officially begin our programming. Our program is a regional partnership with like-minded organizations seeking to reduce congestion and improve air quality by reducing single occupancy vehicles, also known as driving alone. The programming offers transportation expertise and complementary assistance to businesses, residential communities, commercial properties, and giving organizations a competitive edge in attaining their carbon reduction goals and tackle challenges such as employee recruitment and retention. Together, we support more than 160 employers across the triangle, representing 150,000 triangle commuters. Today's topic speaks to one of the main tenets of our region's transportation demand management program, travel, education, and safety. Encouraging residents to bike and how to safely use the infrastructure we see added to our streets are critical to the future of our region and expanding access. So the more people in our communities choose to bike instead of traveling by car, when biking is a reasonable choice for their schedule, skills, and abilities. Our grant funded services programs and materials are provided through our partnership of municipalities and public transportation agencies. And I encourage you to visit their site or gotriangle.org slash employer services to learn more. 
So thank you all to our TVM partners who help make this programming and who encourage participation in our events. And now I would like to introduce to you our main event for the day. You have joined us just three days away from the official launch of Bike Month, and that is why we wanted to host this now. It is my pleasure to introduce Justin Laidlaw. He is a lifelong Durham resident, formerly with R.N. Harris Elementary as a child, Brogdon Middle School and Riverside High as a teenager, on to Durham Tech and an NC Central alum. He spent most of his childhood in the Watts Hillendale neighborhood and his adult life in East Durham. For six years, Justin served as the Director of Communications at Runaway, a local clothing and lifestyle brand, before becoming a freelance marketing specialist. In 2020, Justin founded Bike Ruski, a multimedia storytelling company. Justin's been a bike commuter since 2014, inspired by his father, who frequently rode his own bike to and from work when Justin was just a child. He enjoys biking for exercise, the community, and the impact on the planet. His biggest pet peeve is people parking their cars in the bike lanes. And for full disclosure, this isn't the first time we've worked with Justin. It was during preparation of this webinar that we realized that he had previously starred in a video highlighting his bus commute. And with that, Justin, thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us, your expertise. And I'm going to hand it over to you now. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for having me. Um... And uh, yeah, thanks everyone for being here for this webinar. I'm, I'm really excited to, to share this information with you all. Um, I promise not to give you uh, any bad information. I know we read the uh, disclaimer there at the beginning. Um, so hopefully this will be uh, good information that you can take with you out in the world. Um, you can feel confident about that. Um, yeah, so let's let's jump, jump right in. Um, before we get started, I guess uh, I will say there will be a... Um, Q and A at the end, as folks, uh, as was mentioned. So, um, if you do have questions, and I, I may not catch them during the uh, presentation, but yeah, feel free to share them, and we'll try to capture them all um, at the end. All right. Um, so to start uh, quickly, we're just going to go over some simple rules of the road. Um, these are great to um, just keep in mind every time you saddle up to get on your bike. Um, and, and, you know, be the best uh, steward of the road that you can be. Uh, the first thing is follow the law. Um, the second thing is be predictable, uh, be conspicuous, uh, think ahead, and be ride ready. Um, and, and that last one, be ride ready, uh, something that's really useful when you're getting ready to take your ride is plan your route. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about different bike infrastructure and ways to navigate the roads, um, but the more aware you are of the route you're taking before you get on your bike, um, the safer and easier your ride will be. Uh, so the first thing we'll talk about today is positioning, um, where you are on the road. Um, when thinking about lane positioning, uh, a person on a bike has a basic right to the road. Um, so when you are a cyclist on the road, um, you have a right to move safely and comfortably um, in that space on the road as a cyclist. Um, the safest place that you could be when on the road is going to be the middle of the lane. Um, so you want to take the middle of the lane uh, that prevents you from, you know, encountering any debris that might be in the shoulder. Um, it also just gives you uh, more space uh, as a cyclist to kind of uh, navigate if, if you're there centered in the lane. Um, and then when thinking about speed, um, just remember that slow moving, moving vehicles um, should be positioned to the right um, and generally only pass other vehicles on the left hand side. Um, and that's, you know, similar to uh, if you were driving in a car as well. Um, a lot of uh, what we'll talk about today in terms of navigating the road as a cyclist, um, a lot of those same principles um, apply to being a driver as well. All right, uh, so when you're changing lanes, um, the five things you wanna remember are to scan. Um, so you want to uh, you know, take a full uh, look back to see um, if any traffic is coming behind you. Um, signal your intention using your hand signs. Um, you know, that's left turn, 
or uh, you know, right turn. Um, so scan, signal your intention, scan again. Um, you, know, you never know if, if things may have changed since uh, you, you look back, cars move pretty quickly sometimes. Uh, yield to traffic uh, and then move smoothly into the other lane. Okay, here we go. Intersection positioning. Uh, so, so one of the, the most important things uh, when thinking about riding uh, through an intersection is your positioning. Um, so you want to be in the rightmost lane that serves your destination. Um, so you can see in this uh, graphic here on the screen, we've got a couple uh, through lanes. We've got a couple right turn lanes as well. Um, so whatever lane best serves your destination, you want to be in the, in the right most lane um, for your safety. Um, and if you do feel uncomfortable or unsafe, you can always um, get off your bike, unmount your bike, uh, and navigate as a pedestrian. Um, that could be getting on the sidewalk um, or getting to an intersection and um, using the crosswalk to uh, cross a road that may feel unsafe. Um, so that, that option is always available to you to unmount your bike. Um, and navigate the, the road as a pedestrian as well. For uh, right turn and through lanes, um, if you're turning right, you want to position yourself in the rightmost third of the lane. Um, so that could be a, a right turn lane, or as you can see in this uh, graphic here, um, sort of your straight and right turn lane. Um, but you want to position yourself in the, in the rightmost third of the lane. And if you're traveling straight, uh, you want to keep yourself positioned in the leftmost third of the lane. All right, uh, double right turn lanes. Um, so the same principles will apply for a double right turn. Um, you want to cross both right turn lanes and position yourself in the right third of the through travel lane. Um, so you, again, can see in this graphic here, if you're in the uh, sort of furthest right lane in that uh, double right turn lane um, and you want to go straight, you want to make your way uh, over to that through lane um, using your uh, scanning and signaling techniques that we talked about earlier. That's super important in these situations. Um, so you want to scan, signal, scan again, make your way over to that through lane uh, and position yourself in the right third of that lane. Um, if you are going to take that right turn, uh, you can stay in the right turn lane, but you want to make sure you're in the uh, right most lane in that position, the way that the cyclist is, um, is shown here in this graphic. So, for multiple left turn lanes, you want to remember your lane rules, select the rightmost lane that leads you to your destination, um, and select the appropriate lane positioning based on any additional destinations uh, that the lane may serve. Um, so you can see in this graphic here, even though you're turning uh, left, you want to be in the rightmost left turn lane that's available to you. Um, so when you actually make that left turn into uh, the, the lane for your next destination, you'll still be in the rightmost lane um, as you're uh, traveling on the next road. Uh, being in that position uh, so it keeps you from the furthest away from uh, potential oncoming traffic in, in that new lane that you're in um, and puts you next to um, you know, the sidewalk or, you know, um, other infrastructure that might be uh, helpful for you in terms of keeping you safe. It could be a sidewalk. It could be a, a bike lane that is now available to you in that uh, in that new lane. So, yeah, remember to position yourself in the rightmost lane, um, even for the um, these turns, multiple turns, left turns. So, for one-way streets uh, with two or more lanes. Uh, similar principles here when making a left turn uh, from a one-way street onto another one-way street, um, it's easiest to ride around the corner on the left. Um, so you can see two cyclists here. Uh, the cyclist on the 
far left-hand side um, is making that left turn. Um, so as opposed to sort of crossing traffic, you want to make sure you're on the furthest left side for that, that left turn on a one-way street. Um, for on and off ramps, um, again, similar principles. Um, you really want to be um, assertive and be uh, intentional about your uh, scanning and signaling, um, making sure that you're paying attention to traffic coming from behind you and from both sides, um, and make yourself as visible and predictable as possible. All right, so we've talked a little bit about uh, navigating sidewalks as a cyclist. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, sidewalks can still be dangerous as a cyclist. Um, sometimes motorists aren't necessarily expecting to see cyclists on the sidewalk. Um, so if you do, for any reason, need to um, you know, pop over to the sidewalk temporarily, um, make sure to use caution um, and you know, lower your speed, uh, you will be potentially navigating through um, you know, other pedestrians, uh, trash bins, all kinds of things on the sidewalk. Um, and then also know the law because um, in some areas, um, riding on the sidewalk um, is actually not allowed uh, for cyclists or illegal for cyclists. So I always think of it as a last resort. Um, if you, for whatever reason, feel unsafe or there's a need to, to make your way onto the sidewalk, I would say do it temporarily, um, but it's, it's probably not the best place for you as a cyclist. Um, yeah, so types of hazards. Um, this is something to, uh, to really keep in mind, um, you know, as, as fun, as enjoyable it is to, to be on a, on a bike, um, there are still things that you have to um, navigate both uh, uh, expected and unexpected. Um, so different types of hazards you might encounter. Uh, the surface that you're riding on, um, that could be cracks in the pavement, that could be uh, railroads that you might have to cross over, um, different plates in the road during construction, things like that. Um, dooring uh, is another uh, type of hazard. Some of you may not have heard this term before, um, but as it's shown in the graphic, it basically is when you are riding uh, next to a car and the driver opens their door and they don't, they may not see you. Um, and so when you're riding with cars next to you, you want to be aware of that. And then visibility as well. Um, just thinking about the time of day you might be riding. Um, you know, if it's early in the morning that you might have bad sun glare. If it's raining, you know, the road conditions could be slippery. If it's dark, um, you want to make sure and have your uh, headlights and, and all the other reflective equipment that make you more visible. So visibility, you know, visibility is another thing to, to keep in mind. Um, great. Uh, so this is something that I'm, I'm really excited to talk about because we're seeing more and more bike infrastructure being built um, here regionally and, and across the country, um, which is really exciting for everyone for the cycle community, but I'm sure for drivers as well, who would rather us have our own lane as opposed to being in the driving lane. Uh, but one thing to keep in mind um, is that although bike infrastructure is bike friendly, um, you want to make sure to know how to use it properly. Um, so we're going to go through a couple of the different um, pieces of bike infrastructure that you may encounter um, and how to, to navigate those. I think we've got a video for this one here. Excited to, to share this with you all. As a cyclist, roundabouts may be intimidating, but in this video, we'll teach you everything you need to know to ride in confidence. Bike riders should operate roundabouts much like a motorist would. Pay attention to any signage or ground markings, especially if you're entering a multi-lane roundabout where lane choice may determine exit location. As you approach the roundabout, begin taking control of your intended lane and ride towards the center. As you get closer, reduce your speed and yield to any pedestrians or vehicles in the roundabout, coming to a full stop if needed. 
Only enter the roundabout when there is a safe gap in traffic. Wait patiently and do not feel pressured by vehicles behind you, as coming to a full stop may require more time for you to regain speed. Once you enter the roundabout, maintain control of your lane, move at a moderate pace, and keep watch of traffic ahead of you. Be exceptionally cautious of other vehicles in multi-lane roundabouts. Attempt to make eye contact and use appropriate hand signals at all times, especially if changing lanes and before you exit the roundabout. As you exit, be prepared to yield to pedestrians and crosswalks. Before incorporating a busy or multi-lane roundabout into your commute, you may want to practice when traffic is low, such as early mornings or weekends. Learn more biking tips at gotriangle.org slash biking. Happy riding. Awesome. Yeah, what a great debut for that uh, that video. Um, so uh, we just saw that um, excellent video on roundabouts. Uh, I'll share a little bit here about bike boxes. Um, some of you may have seen more and more of these. Um, bike boxes are um, set up right at the... Um, at the end of an intersection, and it allows cyclists um, to navigate safely, um, essentially up to uh, the the front of the intersection uh, to position themselves in front of traffic um, for safely navigating to their next destination. Um, at times, uh, you know, you may be in a bike lane, and the bike lane ends um, on the other side of the intersection, and so you either need to make a left turn. Um, or need to be able to enter into the main lane safely. Uh, and so bike boxes um, allow cyclists to um, easily navigate that intersection, um, get in the front position, and then safely um, make the uh, directional choice that they need to, to make. And then two-stage turn lanes um, are actually... Uh, relatively new to me. I believe there are a couple in Raleigh now. I don't believe Durham has any yet, but I think they're a great addition to the bike uh, infrastructure uh, that um, cities are starting to adopt. Uh, it, it works in a similar manner to a bike box um, and in two stages. Um, you will, uh, as you can see in the diagram here, the cyclist um, is going to uh, enter the green uh, space here in the bike lane, uh, navigate over to uh, this other green box that's designated here with the cycle, with the bicycle and the turn arrow. That's going to put that cyclist um, in front of the uh, traffic that is going in the direction that they wish to turn. Um, and then when the light changes, they are able to now move uh, in the direction of the um, traffic that they're they're following, or the, the direction that they're going. Um, so the two stages are: uh, they're going to pull uh, pull over into this bike box, essentially um, wait there in position in front of the traffic there, um, and then when the light changes, they're able to safely navigate with traffic um, either into the lane or into uh, the bike lane, whatever infrastructure is available there. Awesome. Um, so just, yeah, as a recap, um, things to consider, uh, the five rules of the road whenever you're getting um, on, on your bike and getting ready to take a trip are um, follow the law, be predictable, be conspicuous, think ahead, and be ride ready. Um, and that last one really includes planning your route. I think that's a really um, helpful way to um, be safe and uh, predictable on the road. And with that, uh, we will take questions. All right, thank you, Justin. Um, again, to help us transition into the Q&A portion, I encourage you to type your questions using the Q&A button um, rather than chat. And if you would like to ask Justin your question uh, directly, please raise your hand virtually and um, we will be able to call on you. We did have a couple of questions that already came in while you were speaking. So, 
I'll kick it off with this one. Um, Justin, do you find having a mirror to be helpful in seeing what is behind you? I do. Yeah. I've, I have mirrors on, um, on my bike, on, on both, both my bikes. And, um, I find that they are helpful for, um, keeping an eye on sort of what your environment is behind you. I wouldn't say that they are a replacement for your, um, scanning and signaling. I still think it's, it's really helpful when you're going to make a turn, um, to check your blind spots, you know, scan, um, see what what traffic is behind you. Um, but yeah, mirrors are great just for um, having another safety mechanism for kind of keeping an eye on the environment around you as a cyclist. Excellent. Um, we have a question from Alyssa. Sometimes the bike lanes and bike lines are interrupted or not completed and do not connect all of the places. So is it better to ride on sidewalks or stay in the normal street? And I know you referenced this earlier. Yeah, um, I would say do what feels the most comfortable and safest for you. Um, my 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 gut answer is to say stay in the normal street you know move from the bike lane um into the middle of the main lane there um whenever safe um and impossible for you to do um the sidewalks again are are more as like a last resort just because in some places um you're not actually allowed to ride on the sidewalk and um they can they can actually be um, sometimes more dangerous than than riding in the road just because of all the other debris and other things you might be navigating on the sidewalk. So um, again, do what feels safest, but I would recommend, yeah, taking the, the street. Um, another question, are there rules regarding passing other cyclists in a single lane situation? Um, yeah, so... Uh, Typically, the the bike lanes um, don't really allow for <laughs> more than one. Uh, well, at least in in my experience, um, you know, the lanes can be pretty narrow. And so, I would say, if you are going to attempt to pass a cyclist in the lane, um, one, uh, make sure that you're um, calling out ahead to let them know that you're behind them. Um, this this is true on on the road, but then it's on uh, trails and, and uh, parkways as well. Um, you always want to call out on your left to let folks know that you're about to pass um, and do it uh, as early as you think they'll hear you um, so you don't creep up on them. Uh, and then, yeah, I would say if you're going to pass that cyclist, um, try to do so, um, you know, giving them enough space. So if you can temporarily move safely into the main lane uh, and and make that pass. And then again, kind of move safely with enough space back into the bike lane. Um, I think that would be the the best way to kind of navigate that, that situation. But um, yeah, be sure that you're communicating with that cyclist so that they know that you're behind them. Excellent. Um, a question about red lights. Am I not supposed to move up to the front of an intersection along the right-hand side when cars are stopped at a red light? Yeah, so you definitely don't want to do that um, for, for a number of reasons. Um, one, you know, depending on what's on the right side of you, it could be a very um, easy place for you to get doored by a parked car. Um, so you, if you move into that space, it really does kind of pinch you between the cars that are in the lane and whatever's on the side of the road. Um, and then also it makes, uh, makes it harder for cars to see you if you are sort of creeping up into their blind spot and coming to the red light. Uh, so just like, um, you know, you would as a vehicle, you want to kind of keep, you know, stay in, stay in the lane, keep your position in the lane. Um, yeah, I, I, I would not recommend, uh, 
trying to pass at the at the red light. And kind of a follow up to that, um, even if it's a little repetitive, a, a question about um, at a red light, do you recommend waiting in line with traffic or making your way past stop vehicles to the front of the line? Um, yeah, uh, I guess to, yeah, to reiterate, um, I would say, yeah, keep your position in the in the middle of the lane um, if there's bike infrastructure that allows you to make that you know maneuver up to the front then um you know take take full advantage of that um but yeah if you're just in a normal lane um I, it's most appropriate to kind of keep your position in the lane um and and navigate as as any other vehicle would Okay, this one, I know we've had some bike advocates asking for several years now. Um, do you see car driving tests um, requiring people to learn how to drive more safely around bikes anytime soon? <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, it's something that we um, are certainly having conversations about both within Bike Durham and just in the cycling community in general. I think that that's a... Um, you know, one of the components, it's, it, it wouldn't solve all the problems, but I think it would be uh, really beneficial to um, be teaching folks how to work, you know, to, to navigate the streets with not just cyclists. I mean, there's all kinds of other modes of transportation, uh, scooters, uh, e-bikes, um, the little one wheel things <laughs> you know, there's uh there's all kinds of stuff now that people are using to get around cities. And so um, I think it's incumbent upon um, all of us, but particularly leadership to make sure that we're setting everyone up, else up to be, uh, to be safe and to be knowledgeable. So I would love to see it. Um, I don't have any direct uh, influence on, on that, but um, I, I think it would be, it seems kind of like a no brainer to me to incorporate that stuff. Um, we're doing really well on time. Um, so this may be going back to a previous slide, Kim. Um, someone has written that they don't understand the two pay, uh, the two stage bike lane. Um, why is the cyclist in the right lane to turn left? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to, I may have, uh, blitzed through that one a little quickly, so I'll try to explain it in more detail. Um, so if you think about, um, if you are in uh, either a, a main lane or a bike lane um, going straight, but you want to make a uh, left-hand turn. Um, so at the sort of the last arrow here in the diagram, you can see is the cyclist is eventually going to go left from their original position. Um, in this situation, it can be particularly uh, difficult to make that turn because you're riding alongside um you know traffic that is going to be going straight and so you would essentially have to try to cut across oncoming traffic to make that left turn um so instead of doing that um this infrastructure is set up for cyclists to be able to pull over um, into this green bike box here um, and you can see this car that's situated sort of uh, on the other side of the crosswalk there uh, next to that bike box. So you'll actually come to a stop in that green bike box um, in front of this car here and wait for uh, the light that you're now positioned in front of to turn green. And then you'll make a, you'll continue straight um, where you can see this second cyclist here um, is uh, now sort of positioned the direction that they want to go. Um, they have the light and they're moving with traffic. Uh, and so when the light turns green, they'll, you know, continue to move, um, you know, move forward either in the lane or in the bike lane, if it's available to them. Um, I think one of the things that um, sort of complements this, um, infrastructure. And again, this is re relatively new, uh, new infrastructure to me. I haven't seen this here in Durham, um, but I know some 
workplaces um, are starting to um, become, uh, starting to take away the right turn on red, um, starting to to restrict more of that turn. Um, and so in this situation, uh, as the cyclist is um, getting themselves into this green bike box, there wouldn't be uh, right turn traffic there to prohibit them from being able to get safely into that space. Um, so yeah, I, I should have mentioned that um, earlier during during this segment, but I think that's one of the important things, um, complements to, to having this infrastructure is preventing people from being able to make that right turn on red um, because then there, there are no ca- you know, you know, other cars that the person is having to worry about when they're getting in that bike box. And I hope that clears up some of that. I think so. And I believe that it may have been covered in um, a prep email that was sent out. City of Raleigh had a video on some of their infrastructure. And if not, um, I think it will be sent out afterwards. So just know that that resource is there as well. Um, You mentioned uh, various different types of vehicles that are out there. Uh, Question regarding if there are any e-bike specific rules for riding, um, or if you're aware of any that are proposed. Um, Yeah, so um, e-bikes, you know, are, you know, operate just like um, cyclists would. Um, I know that there are some, uh, there are more strict rules for different or higher classes of motor essentially like motorized bikes um so you know some e-bikes uh the amount of um power that you can get out of the the motor or the electricity um you know only allows you to go you know 25 miles an hour 20 25 miles an hour um and that those are sort of lower class bikes um but then there are some that you see on the road that essentially look like mopeds or motorcycles and those are a higher uh class of of e-bike um and many of those you actually have to to register um and you'll you'll see um when you're sort of shopping for uh e-bikes they'll actually tell you um if the bike is um, capable of moving into these higher classes and and what steps to take to um, to register those bikes. Often those are not allowed in uh, bike lanes or places, you know, bike infrastructure in general. Uh, you'll see signs, I've, I've seen more and more signs now um, on places like the Tobacco Trail and other uh, greenways and things like that. Um, that specify like what class of of bikes are allowed. Um, so yeah, in terms of rules for e-bikes, um, if you're in, I think it's class one and two. I, I should know this. I just got in, an e-bike myself a, a month ago. Um, it doesn't go quite that fast. Um, but uh, yeah, if you're in the sort of lower classes of e-bikes, um, you can still operate in the bike infrastructure. Obviously. You want to, um, you know, um, take precaution and sort of be aware of um, other cyclists on the road, just like you would um, on a regular bike. Uh, But yeah, in terms of like specific rules for e-bikes, my understanding is that really it depends on that class that they're in. We have a question in Q&A, and it um, kind of echoes one of the questions that we got in the pre-registration form. Um, Do you have advice for becoming more comfortable with riding on the road? Um, Did you practice on less busy roads or off hours? And I think that falls in line with the question. um, um, Can you share any ideas to help encourage others to consider commuting by bike? Yeah. Um, yeah, those, those are great questions. Um, obviously I would love to see more folks on bikes, um, or just, yeah, more folks using, uh, 
alternative transportation. Uh, but for cycling specifically, um, I think, yeah, practicing on a, on a less busy road um, is a great way to um, get some of those reps in. Um, but also, you know, grab a, a friend or a buddy um, who is maybe a, a more seasoned cyclist um, and see if they'll you know, ride with you, whatever route you're considering, you know, have that person ride the route with you um, so that you can become more comfortable. Um, I would also say group rides are a great um, opportunity for that as well. Um, I find that the group rides, you know, folks that take them are um, very encouraging. Um, they are not, you know, no one's getting left behind. Uh, the ride leaders are very good about sort of setting people up to succeed you know, during the rides in terms of laying out the, the map, um, you know, refreshing people on the rules and, you know, how to communicate with other cyclists, things like that. So, um, you know, the group rides are yet another um, opportunity to do that. Um, we also just started offering classes um, and we may talk some about that at the end. I'm not sure, but I'll, I'll jump the gun here and say, um, that, yeah, if you go to the Bike Drone website, um, we have uh, adult education classes that we offer. Um, so if folks want more hands-on training, um, you know, there's an opportunity to, to get that as well through, through Bike Durham. And, um, you know, I don't know if anyone would be watching this from other places in <laughs> uh, outside of the Raleigh-Durham area, but if you happen to be, I'm sure there are organizations um, that can help facilitate that as well. Um, yeah. And then last thing on that, um, you know, if you think that where you live, you maybe can't um, do a full um, bicycle ride from home to work or um, home to downtown, for instance, um, you could always pair cycling with um, another form of transportation, like, um, you know, doing a park and ride, or um, taking the bus, uh, you know, putting your, your bike on the, on the bus and taking the, the bus, you know, halfway to your destination or something like that and cycling um, the rest of it. So, yeah, combining cycling with um, other uh, transportation types is kind of a way to, to ease yourself into it. Another one um, came in through survey as well as uh, echoed in Q&A. You keep referencing that it could be against the law to ride on the sidewalk in North Carolina. Is it illegal? Does it differ by municipality? Yeah, so it's, it is my understanding that it, the municipalities make the rules themselves. Um, it is also my understanding that it is technically illegal in Durham. Um, I'm not totally sure about Raleigh. Um, you all may be able to to clarify that for me, but um, yeah, in, in some, uh, it, yeah, it depends on the municipality, but I know in Durham, you're technically not supposed to, to ride on the sidewalk. And, um, you know, that's part of the reason why we push so hard for, for the different municipalities to incorporate more bike infrastructure, because it does make it really limited for folks, um, particularly ones who are not as confident on the road, um, you know, ride, going from not cycling at all to riding in traffic can feel uh, a bit daunting for some folks. So having that bike infrastructure really does allow people to um, move into becoming a commuter, um, you know, with confidence and, and feeling safe. Excellent. Um, also, I see that Judith has put um, a little bit more information um, in the Q&A about e-bikes. So if you have interest in that, know that that is there. Um, another question coming up about construction. Um, what should one do when construction, a big problem in my area, suddenly redirects pedestrians and uh, bikers to the opposite side of the street? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, you know, in again, in, in most instances, um, you know, you want to continue to operate like other vehicles on the road. Um, so following the traffic pat the, the new traffic pattern that construction has created um you know staying in line with uh the rest of traffic um, if there's a particular reason that this construction feels um you know makes the road feel 
um, like you can't navigate it or if it's, um, you know, increasingly dangerous, then I would say, um, you know, it's, it's okay to, you know, pull off to the side on the sidewalk, um, you know, and operate as a pedestrian temporarily, um, you know, until the construction is cleared. Um, but yeah, ideally you would continue to operate, um, like the other vehicles on the road and, um, hopefully the, you know, folks who are directing traffic, um, are, um, respecting you as a cyclist, um, and allowing you to move, um, safely through that traffic, um, as opposed to like letting cars go by you or letting cars go through. Um, and that again is where I think being in the middle of the lane and sort of really sort of owning your space in the lane can be valuable. Um, just so you're visible, um, not just to cars, but to, um, folks like construction workers. Um, I think that that kind of positioning really helps in those situations. So yeah, I would say navigate like a vehicle through the construction area, um, you know, follow the, the signs or the, ways that they're moving you through. And if it does feel uncomfortable, um, you know, dismount and uh, operate as a pedestrian for as long as you need to. Thank you. Um, I see Mark has put a response um, that in Chapel Hill, it is legal to ride on the sidewalk except for downtown. Um, so thank you for that, Mark. Um, if anyone knows otherwise, please let us know. Um, Following up on the last question, um, I think it fits as well. During your presentation, you mentioned dooring. What advice would you give to avoid this phenomenon? Yeah, um, yeah, that's really where positioning comes comes back into play. Um, you know, I would say uh, if you're riding next to an area with a lot of street parking, um, you know, positioning yourself. Um, you know, as far enough away as possible, um, whether it's the middle lane, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily advise going all the way over to the left side of the lane just because it puts you closer to um, the oncoming traffic lane. But um, yeah, sort of holding your position in the middle of the lane as opposed to the uh, rightmost side of the lane to yeah give you enough space to... Um, yeah, so that you're not super close to the, the vehicles there. Um, you know, again, it's not um, it's not always the the easiest thing to do, depending on how the road is set up. Um, so yeah, I don't want anyone to <laughs> assume that all these things are um, a piece of cake. But uh, yeah, the general principle being sort of keeping yourself positioned in the middle of the lane so that. Um, you know, a person, uh, even if they were to, you know, open their door and, and not see you that, you know, you have enough space, uh, to, um, either sort of just ride comfortably in the lane or, uh, you know, navigate quickly, uh, away from the vehicle as you're passing. And another question about lane position. As I ride into the intersection, staying in the rightmost lane, but the rightmost lane is converting into a right turn only lane, what's the recommended action? Do I merge into the rightmost straight through lane right away? Hmm. So we're, the lane is becoming a right only lane, but we want to keep going straight. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would say in that case, um, you know, try to scan and, and safely merge over um, sooner rather than later, um, just because, uh, yeah, inter intersections are particularly chaotic. Um, but yeah, whenever you sort of um, have an idea of where you want to go, I would say, you know, make that transition over to the lane um, as early as you and safely as you can. Um, that's true for, um, you know, bike lanes as well. Um, if they don't offer a bike box or something like that, and you can see, you know, up ahead that a bike lane is ending, 
Um, I would recommend starting to scan and see when you're able to merge um, as soon as possible um, so that you're not, you don't kind of get squeezed at that fibers um, at the end of that, uh, at that intersection where you now are trying to kind of, you know, move over at the, the light itself. Um, so yeah, whether it's a right, you know, a right turn lane, um, a, an ending of a bike lane, uh, if you know that the lane you're in is not going to allow you to get to the, um, to your destination, yeah, make that, that merge over um, as soon as possible. Excellent. Um, Brenton, I did see your example um, asking if something is a two-stage um, turn lane in Raleigh. Tim, I don't know if you have the ability to open up um, that image, um, but we can certainly look at that, even if it's the last thing that we answer. If you're able to stay on, that would be great. Um, we got a question. Do you have any recommendations for best routes between Durham and Chapel Hill by bike? It seems there's no great routes currently, and I'm wondering if there are any plans for improving access between the municipalities. Um, yeah, in terms of best routes for between Durham and Chapel Hill, um, I don't personally do that trip um, very often, so um, I don't have any routes that I um, can specifically attest to, but I do know that um, there are a couple different um, ways, I guess, or, or yeah, ways that you could um, you know look at trying to plan a route there. Um, one is um, Google Maps is actually getting much better about um, you know using the, the maps feature to um, preview a route wherever you're going. So you can you know get on Google Maps, switch over from um, car to cycle, and um, you know it's it's not uh, yeah it's still evolving, but it has gotten better. And I would say that's a, a place that you could start. Um, also, the um, East Coast Greenway Alliance, um, who's based here in Durham, um, they have a great map of all the um, trails and, and pathways that they're trying to connect um, to create this um, yeah, interconnected path network um, all up and down the East Coast. Um, so they're a great resource as well to look at. Um, for um, for routes like that. Um, I know that some folks will post their routes that they've done um, using different apps like uh, Strava or Ride with GPS. Um, that's something that we use quite a bit at Bike Durham, Ride with GPS, um, when we're promoting uh, bike rides that we're doing um, either before community meetings or during bike month, which is coming up next month. So um, there are probably folks that have done that route before, you know, Durham to Chapel Hill and have posted um, the one that they think is the, you know, most effective or the, the safest. So, yeah, I would I would check out those resources. And I would love to do the trip one day myself. I mentioned that I just got an e-bike, so I feel a little bit more comfortable doing those long distances. Um, so, yeah, maybe we can organize a Durham to Chapel Hill uh, ride sometime soon. And we are running close on time. Um, I will add on to that. There is the Triangle Bikeway study. You can find it at trianglebikeway.com. Um, we have a question regarding um, what uh, drivers and bus riders can do. Um, I did post in the answer section um, the link to Go Triangle's YouTube page. Uh, right now, the automatic uh, response link that you get on that is a 90 second video um, regarding the um, bike friendly driving. Um, I encourage you to look for that. There's longer ones as well. And also look around the region for bike-friendly driving courses. They can be up to a half a day. If you can get people to attend, that would be great. So um, in order for us to end on time, 
Justin, thank you for the great information and the insight. We could not have done this webinar without the guidance and participation of you, um, other by Durham staff and the volunteers. There are several others that work behind the scenes to create the content that's right for our region. Um, thank you to everyone who has joined us. Um, it's fitting that we are doing this just a few days from the start of May, which is bike month with tons of social activities and rides to join. Um, I hope you'll get information on what's happening in your city at gotriangle.org slash bike month. If you scroll down, you will see green buttons for universities and municipalities where you can find all sorts of stuff going on with you. Um, additionally, we have uh, more stuff coming up with Go Triangle. May is bike month, but June is the golden modes. So we'll be holding that for pers in person for the first time in three years on June 8th. And Mitchell Silver, former commissioner for New York uh, City Parks Department and also known as a former director of planning for Raleigh, will be there. Uh, he should be great. We should be great. Uh, there will be other organizations that are tabling. And as part of that, we will be um, recognizing some superior cyclists across the region, including um, Golden Spokes for Business. So if you love a business because of how they accommodate bikes and attract cyclists, um, nominations for that will begin May 1st and run through the 15th. So look for that and the opportunity to nominate your favorite business um, for being bike friendly. And um, let's see. Lastly, um, we try to end each of our Mission Impossible webinars with a survey to help us to continue to bring content um, and interesting topics for you. For those who participate in the survey, it is anonymous, but um, if you want the opportunity to win um, a registration, a free registration to bike Durham's um, classes. One fortunate survey participant will win that. You will get to choose which level class you want to participate in. So there's cycling basics and there's also skills one-on-one. -on -one. And the drawing will be held at noon um, on May 1st, so Monday. And I hope that you will participate in that um, I believe that there is a link going into the chat for bikedurham.org um, for those bike education classes. They also have a ton of events going on throughout the month. And again, very special thank you to Bike Durham for graciously providing um, that class as a giveaway and also for participating and supporting this webinar. Special thanks to Nancy Cox, um, Yokopo Mantobi, oh, excuse me on that one, um, James Nashimuto, Sean King, um, Stefan Waltz, and Kim Johnson. If you are interested in participating in any of the Bike Durham classes, they have a sliding scale for registration fees. So I hope that you will check it out. Um, Bike Durham just wants to encourage more cycling for everyone. So it doesn't matter where you are in the triangle or if you are just visiting us, um, they would love to have you participate. And we are so glad to have you participate today. Thank you so much. I hope to see you at Bike Month activities across the region. Thanks, everyone.